Coming up in today's show, stocks finish the day mixed, inflation drops, consumer spending rises, oil rallies again, and we'll take a look at the best performing sector so far this year. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the Click Capital Daily Market Show. Hope you're all doing well out there. My name's Jared, and I'm going to run you through all the top news, data, and charts across markets today. And so even though we finished the week higher again, it was a bit of a mixed finish as we make our way through Q4 earnings season. And it was actually tech, the laggard today, led lower by semiconductors after we got that earnings report from Intel. And the market's negative reaction to that shares down almost 12%. We've still got energy, oil, and gas holding up pretty good on the back of crude popping up. And we got some nice pops today in some healthcare stocks. Let's look at the daily chart, S&P 500 closing at 48.90, just below all time highs. And just switching over to our weekly chart, I noticed something interesting today. That is if we look back on the prior rallies, like the one we got in October up until late January that rose about 20% and after the regional banking crisis in March when we bottomed and ripped up again until July we rose another 20% then the most recent market bottom in late October here we are today at 19.5% so for us to do another 20% rally would take us to about 49.50 and like we can see with my technical indicators here we're getting to the top of my buy sell bands and for those of you who don't know, this is my own custom indicator that I built four years ago as an improvement on Bollinger Bands and designed for mean reversion trading, doesn't squeeze up like Bollinger Bands do. Also seen some reversal signals up here, possibly showing some signs of exhaustion in the market. And so out of the major stock sectors, the leader this year has been semiconductors, still up almost 8% year to date. Now we're looking on the daily chart here. We're looking like we're pretty extended and may have just got a bit of a reversal signal on that dark cloud cover candle we got yesterday. And looking on the weekly chart, got a bit of a spinning doji that could turn into a bit of a shooting star if we close lower next week. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but actually the best performing sector looking at all sectors so far this year is that of cannabis. Just looking at the most popular ETF, MSOS which is currently up a bit over 30% so far year to date. And this is one of my top 10 picks this year and is having a really good start right out of the gate. And just going out to a weekly chart, you can see we're still well off those early 2021 highs. However, we are putting in a really good base here on volume. We're just looking at this resistance zone with a high of 988 to take out. Then there's no overhead resistance in the last year. So technically it's looking good. And this is thanks to some positive developments in the industry, namely with the US Department of Health and Human Services, hinting at potential changes to marijuana's classification in August. That's after they recommended the DEA to reschedule it to three. And along with that, hopefully some potential relief from the burdensome 280E tax for US-based cannabis operators. So, so far they've been at a huge disadvantage without being able to claim business expense as a tax deduction, not to mention being barred from dealing with national banks and not being able to get proper listings on the big board exchanges. All of these things kind of choke in the industry. Now, there's a lot of optimism from industry insiders that the DEA should do the right thing and reschedule it. And hopefully some more traction from the Biden administration as well, making good on his campaign promise to legalize at a federal level, which should then also see the industry jump over the last hurdle of the Safer Banking Act, allowing cannabis businesses the same access to the financial system as all other industries. That's still up in the air. However, according to GovTrack, still about a 68% chance of that being enacted. So I'll be looking for more good things in this space this year. And that's why I listed it as my top pick in my 10 picks this year that I released at the start of the year. And I'll continue to stick with that and see it all the way through. Moving on to the latest read on inflation data. The Fed's preferred gauge to help them decide where interest rates should be. Personal consumption expenditures, the PCE, coming in a little lower than expected, showing the trend over the last year and inflation is continuing down. However, that was only in the core PCE price index year over year, just a tad lower than expected at 2.9%, with headline coming in as expected. 2.6% year over year. However, we're getting mixed signals for the Fed because we've also got personal spending coming in a bit hotter than expected, 0.7% growth month over month. Showing retailers did have a good holiday season and the consumer is still out there in force. And that kind of makes it a little tricky for the Fed on when they should start cutting rates because we do have some inflation gauges coming down, but we still got a really strong consumer. However, there are some potential signs we may be going to see an uptick in inflation in the months ahead. Because looking at some of the biggest inputs into inflation, like this chart here of world shipping rates, getting a big bounce back with what's happening in the Red Sea. And this chart correlates with that big increase we got in CPI in late 21 into 22. And of course, with CPI coming down, that helped a lot. And you got to remember, CPI and these inflation readings that we're getting are a bit lagging. When one of the best leading indicators, the price of oil, is actually climbing and breaking out again today. After we've got a bit of a reversal in supply and production, 
with the cold weather we've had in North America. We're also hearing of some big stimulus coming out of China. They're trying to get demand growing again. And Iran-backed militants aren't seeming to be letting up and look to be continuing their pursuit of disrupting Western trade and the movement of goods. Not only that, you've got to remember who's the biggest driver of inflation and always has been, always will, is the government and the Federal Reserve. And so, yes, the U.S. economy grew pretty good in Q4 GDP, coming in $328 billion higher. However, the government budget deficit actually increased more at 509 and total debt increased at 833 So the government's doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the economy. There's a look at the dry bulk shipping ETF, which tracks freight futures. See that huge rip up over the last couple of months with what's going on in the Red Sea. And there's a look at crude oil futures. Popping up again today. Here we are, back above $78 a barrel. Look, looking like we could hit $80 a barrel next week, just after we were flirting with the high 60s. So it's a reasonable question to ask, is an inflation shock coming? Because markets are really not pricing that in at all. And just looking at this chart here, overlaying the change in CPI from 2013 up until July last year. And so right now, inflation's around here, around this same point, in a very eerily similar path to CPI, year-over-year change in inflation from 1966 going into the mid-70s. We got that first initial wave higher, then it came off. A lot of people probably thought, gee, I'm glad that's done. Got rid of that high inflation, we're back to the good times at 2-3%. However, they were in for a huge shock. It went even higher again in the late 70s, climbing above 14%. And that was a lost decade for stocks. Pretty much went sideways that whole decade. And commodities, namely oil and gold, shot higher and did really well. In addition to mining stocks and value stocks actually outperformed as well. But looking at the price action in the stock market, it's obviously not worried about a resurgence in inflation and Fed fund futures as well. Whilst they have been pushing out the date of when they think the Fed's going to start cutting and potentially a sign of a structural repricing, they still think overall the Fed is going to steadily decrease rates this year into Christmas, expecting them to go below 4%. And so it's going to be interesting to watch this chart react if we continue to see a bump up in shipping rates, the price of oil, and we do have a strong consumer unemployment low. So there are some ingredients there for a resurgence in inflation, especially if we were to see a spillover with what's going on in the Middle East. And once again, another eerily similar setup to the geopolitical situation in the 1970s with the Yom Kippur War, a lot of Arab nations attacking Israel, which caused the price of oil to shut up and was the main driver of inflation. And so Treasury yields have been acting a little funny lately, even though we got that mild PCE inflation data. Yields still finished higher today across the curve, with a bit more strength in the long dated stuff causing the yield curves to continue their path back to zero. We can see that in the two-year yield, which may be forming a bit of a base here around 4.3 and a bit of a better bump up in the 10-year yield, which seems to be in a solid short-term uptrend, now just below 4.4. However, just don't tell that to most investors who are still more bullish on stocks than any time in the last two years. And we're seeing that across a number of sediment readings. In addition to a Vanguard survey, which according to results, investors expect stocks to return 5.7% over the next 12 months, which was more than double their expectation for 23. Also seen that in the AAII investor sediment survey with bearish readings down the bottom of their three-year range. Also in the active managers exposure index, back to above 80%, nearing the top of its two-year range. And most famously, the CNN fear and greed index which has been above 60 since late november and just looking back in history here typically when it's gone above 60 is marked short-term tops in s p 500 we can see that in march 22 august 22 december 22 jan 23 to stay persistently overbought from may into july last year before we got a bit of a correction in the market and here we are now the market being most persistently technically overbought that it has been for years so like i said at the start of this video it's reasonable to expect the market could be due for a bit of a correction or pullback. Maybe we hit that 49.50 or even flirt with a big psychological 5,000 on the S&P for the first time ever. Probably pull in a lot of new money. Could be a bit of a bull trap above 5,000. And then we may have a bit of a correction. And just looking at those last two times, the market rose 20%. We did get a 50% pullback in March. Then when we ripped up from March to late July, got a little bit over a 50% pullback into that Fibonacci golden pocket. And so if we were to do the same thing here, and when, let's say we did make it up to 49.50, then if we got that same golden pocket retracement, that would take us to around 4,500 
on the S&P. And that doesn't mean we're in a bear market. We could still be in a bull market. That's just a healthy correction and pullback that we see quite often in trends. The market will get a little too excited, a bit exhausted, consolidate, then do a 50-60% retracement of the move. But we've still got some influential investors out there who are not convinced that we're in a sustainable bull market. That's the modern-day bond king, founder of Double Line, CEO billionaire Jeffrey Gunlock. Says avoid expensive stocks, set aside some cash, and brace for a recession. Doesn't like stocks at current valuations. Says the inverted yield curve and leading economic data signal problems ahead. And he's setting aside cash to buy bargains in markets like India and Japan. Going on to say we're in a valuation spot in the equity market where I think you have to start looking long term kind of skip this last phase of the exuberance game because I think the values are very, very high. Referring to the yield curve, he said, when you start to de-invert, you really get to be on recession watch. The fact that recession hasn't come after 80 plus weeks of yield curve inversion, it's very bad logic to say it's not coming because the de-inversion is happening. And this is the yield curve chart he's referring to, the 10 year minus the two year. We initially went inverted way back in April 22, went really deep for really long. I think it's fair to say that this is a bottom and back we go higher. And once we go above that zero line, like Jeffrey Gunlock says, looking back in history, typically the recession's just around the corner. How have we got some other long time investors? Not so sure we're gonna get a recession. That's Bert Malkiel saying, don't worry about the recession forecast. However, he did admit there are some pricey stocks out there and that he absolutely hates Bitcoin. Continuing to say the best place to be is index funds and that lofty stock valuations are likely to weigh on investors' returns going ahead. He called out mindless speculation on meme stocks and cryptocurrencies, saying they're a real danger. He said Bitcoin is especially worrisome given its volatility and lack of utility. Going on to say this is not a useful currency. It's only only uses are to hide things from the government and for ransomware. I don't want to go in and buy my Starbucks coffee in the morning with Bitcoin, which may be worth 45000 one day and 40000 the next. And those long-time investors may be right when it comes to valuations. Just looking at the trailing price-to-earnings ratio in the S&P over the last 20 years, we're currently sitting at the 92nd percentile. Only 8% of the time we've been more expensive, and that was pretty much all in the post-COVID mania. The rock-bottom interest rates... Huge amount of government stimulus, not to mention record amounts of Fed liquidity and quantitative easing. Not only looking at the stock market in absolute valuation terms is it expensive, but even more so when you compare S&P 500 earnings yield to that of the two-year Treasury bond is actually gone negative. In other words, the equity risk premium is negative. A lot of the secular bull market we've had over the last 10 years because the earnings yield on stocks, that's the S&P 500 PE ratio expressed as a yield, was much higher than bonds. However, looking back back in history, that negative premium can persist for a number of years like we saw in the late 90s. However, just like back then, the forward returns on stocks wasn't good for the next 10 years. However, just like a lot of people said back in the late 90s, it's different because the internet is a new paradigm, for which they were correct, except the market just got well ahead of itself in valuations. People are saying this time it's AI that's going to take us into the future and these old valuation metrics don't really matter anymore. We'll just have to see about that. Moving on to Bitcoin, we've got a bit of a bounce here today. Now getting into the second week of all these new Bitcoin ETFs being traded on the market. Coin reclaiming the $40,000 price level and I'm still seeing a lot of people on Twitter in the crypto community saying this is just the beginning. We're definitely going to hit $100,000 this year before Christmas, which would make it one of the easiest trades ever for these new Bitcoin ETFs. BlackRock one having a nice bounce today up 5.4% and Bitcoin itself putting in a bit of a reversal candle. Now just below 42,000 a coin, still below the 50 day VWAP. But like I showed earlier this week on the monthly chart of Bitcoin, we've still got some work to do because from those crazy highs in late 21 down to the deep lows a year later, right now looking at the monthly, Bitcoin's rejected off that golden pocket and we're currently putting in a bit of a spinning doji candle on the monthly, which can be a sign of a top like we saw in this spinning doji back here. We had a big fall before we put in a double top and then she really fell over. So for Bitcoin to really break out into a new bull market, we'd have to take out that $50,000 level with conviction and really hold there. And who knows, we may be pumped to 100,000 this year. Anything's possible when it comes to Bitcoin as it's all based on perception. It is a non-productive asset. No one really uses it as a day-to-day -day currency. And that's why you see the biggest holders constantly out there pumping it up, hyping it up because they know that is the key driver to its valuation, is getting more and more people to pile on top of them. Just like a classic pyramid scheme. And you know what? It's worked pretty good for them so far. Moving on to one of the biggest stories in markets this week was Tesla earnings. They got absolutely bushwhacked afterwards, down 12%. Elon really spooked the market. Now got BYD 
in China overtaking Tesla for the first time. Chinese EV makers really catching up, selling their cars for a lot cheaper. Elon's been trying to respond by dropping the price of Tesla which is squeezing their margins. Not to mention we're still in a high interest rate environment, relatively speaking. And since EVs are a large ticket item, a lot of consumers rely on financing to buy a Tesla. And just like this article in the Wall Street Journal says, this year the Tesla stock isn't so magnificent. A lot of people saying it doesn't deserve to be in the Magnificent 7 anymore. Their market cap now getting close to half a trillion. A lot of the Mag 7 are above a trillion. And so this stock and Tesla management have got their work cut out for them this year to prove to the market that they do deserve a lofty valuation and to keep thinking of the long-term picture instead of what's happening right now. But valuations all based on perception. And so it can cut both ways. A lot of people still think Tesla's stock hasn't fallen enough. Some people see a further 30% downside. To make matters worse, just got news. Tesla's recalling nearly 200,000 vehicles in the US over a rear view camera bug. There's a look at the daily chart of Tesla today, calling up on an inside day, pretty much finishing the day flat, and just taking it out to a monthly chart. It too is showing long-term signs of topping. This could be potentially a head and shoulders formation. I've got the neckline there around 175 as kind of the line in the sand to defend. And so we're currently down about 55% from those crazy highs in late 21. It had dropped 75% early last year when it got down to $100 a share. And I think a lot of people don't realize even the best stocks in the market over time can have some huge 80, 90% drawdowns. For example, Amazon, one of the best performing stocks in the market ever had a similar pattern in the late 90s to Tesla in the last couple of years. Ripped up like crazy, put in a big topping formation. Then in the space of two short years, actually fell 95%. And that's what makes investing so hard and why you must diversify is because all these investors here were saying Amazon's gonna be the future, Jeff Bezos is great, they're gonna sell everything, they're the leader, they're gonna dominate, the business is growing, the revenue's growing. Well, they were all right. But how many of them do you think held throughout this 95% drawdown? My bet is not many, if any. Apple as well did an 82% drawdown in that time. And so if we were to see Tesla do a similar 85, 90% drawdown from its highs, that would take us to under $50 a share. And don't get me wrong, I like Tesla as a brand long-term and I actually hope we get down to under $50 a share over the next year or so, because then I'll be backing up the truck and loading up shares in my long-term position. However, at 582 billion market cap right now, I just don't think it's cheap, unless we see some really good numbers coming out of Cybertruck this year. And of course, they have no other hiccups or surprises along the way with the rollout of new gigafactories. And the big one, they stopped decreasing their prices to try and defend their margin. Moving on, we've still got the fear and greed index really elevated here at 77. It's not gonna stay there forever. And Corporate Insight is still not doing a lot of trading in this market, both buying and selling. Overall, stock market breadth is still positive. 70% of stocks above their long-term 200-day average. And a modest 370 stocks and ETFs breaking out at 52-week highs. Today, notably Amazon, Netflix, Berkshire, Meta, even Verizon's breaking out. And a very thin 37 securities breaking down to 52 week lows, mostly just inverse ETFs, nothing too much else really noteworthy. Another classic VIX crush Friday, finishing lower, benefiting the option dealers, now sitting just above 13. And the VIX has been down here for quite some time now with this parabolic rally in the stock market, volatility is suppressed. Although volatility risk premium still holding up somewhat. And there's a look at TLT continuing to coil up here a bit with high yield bonds continuing to trade a lot better. Dollar index still tracking sideways. And there's a look at gold continuing to look a little soft here with some continued volatility and natty gas. A little bit of a soft pullback across China securities today. Clean energy still soft and come back to the channel next week. Just like I did a bit of a deep dive into China this week. I'm going to go into clean energy next week as I think that's the number two most cheapest asset class across financial markets at the moment. With one of the most interesting ones no one's really talking about and that is of hydrogen. Really oversold here on the monthly and we're just getting the fourth consecutive bullish reversal signal of mine which could be setting up a good risk reward here. International stock indices finished the week all on a positive note. China still holding above its 50 day VWAP there. Nikkei and the Aussie still strong as well. Some inflation expectations still holding ground. Semiconductor is the worst performing sector today and tech in general followed by gold miners and a little bit of a defensive bump up in those sectors. Magnificent 7 a little soft here today. None of them moving more than 1% up or down. And what really pulled down the semis and tech today was Intel after its earnings yesterday. Actually beat expectations, but they did give disappointing guidance for which the street punished them for. A lot of people forget they're still the biggest computer processor maker in the world. And just like IBM, 
and these other legacy hardware makers they're really trying to make inroads into the AI game catch up to all their younger peers like Nvidia and AMD which have really stolen the spotlight from these old guys a lot and we'll be keeping an eye on Intel this was one of my favorite stocks last year which turned out to be one of the best performing S&P 500 stocks almost doubling in price last year however like I always say price leads fundamentals follow we pay attention to the technicals first fundamentals second so no matter how good the story if this goes into a downtrend then I wouldn't want to be long it and so I'll draw a bit of a support box right around this level here psychological $40 price we've turned there before we bounced off there in September and we'll use that as a line in the sand to see if this old semiconductor can hold up because we've still got Nvidia just below all-time highs that it got back on Wednesday at 628. There's a look at the two biggest oil stocks in the States, Exxon Mobil seeming to have found a bottom and same with Buffett's favorite Chevron also popping up a bit here. We'll get to hear earnings from them in a week's time. So look at the spread I've been watching on the new Bitcoin ETF versus Coinbase coming back up to highs and a bit of a fall back in Spirit Airlines today. Apparently JetBlue could be backing away from the merger is becoming a meme favorite with the likes of Dave Portnoy. However, looking back at his history, he's been one of the best contrarian indicators out there and so this could very well trade down to a penny stock before being delisted either way it's likely to remain very volatile huge pump today in the largest luxury retailer in the world Louis Vuitton after releasing their earnings which they missed they gave a good outlook and this could be a bit of a dead cap bounce after it's been weak for quite a while here the telecoms AT&T and Verizon continue to trade really well along with the banks holding their ground after they kicked off earnings two weeks ago okay guys that's a wrap for the week there we are on the S&P 500 coiling up just below all-time highs markets doing pretty well considering we've got a bounce back in yields got oil breaking out and Q4 earnings is continuing to come in a little mixed, a bit below long-term averages with beats. Got a few gap ups, few gap downs here and there. Breadth is still reasonably holding up, but like we can see in my sector trends table indicate, it's quite mixed out there. Got no real blanketed bullish or bearish breadth across the board, kind of sector by sector, stock by stock. And like I showed on the weekly chart, if we were to hit that 20% advance, like the last two rallies we got, that would take us about 49.50. However, I think the market would be really attracted to the big 5,000. We may just pop above that before we get this kind of overdue correction or pullback. The Fed meets next week for their first meeting of the year. Pretty much a given they're going to stay on hold. How are we looking at the language they give? See whether they indicate they're going to cut in March. They could get things moving a bit after we hear from Jay Powell. Other than that, a pretty sleepy finish. And the market just put in its 12th green weekly candle over the last 13 weeks and what's been the most parabolic rip up since the pride ball market rolled over in late 21 so that's it for now make sure you come back to the channel next week like i said i'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into clean energy i'm also putting the final touches on my online course which I expect to release in about two weeks' time. Really excited to bring that one to you guys. I think you're going to love it. Other than that, have a great relaxing weekend, and I'll see you again next week. Cheers.